Is Pesedi. that Pesedi? Okay, sorry, I didn't get the pronunciation. Uh, Bruce Pesedi is our first speaker, and he does need to be out of here at a reasonable time, so we'll start, start moving. Um, he is a professor of medicine and epidemiology at the University of Washington, uh, also a senior investigator at the Group Health Research Institute in Seattle. Uh, he's uh, known for a number of things, which I guess we're going to find out. He's a regular JAMA commentator, and I've been told uh, was the uh, Bush FDA's worst nightmare. I don't know what that's about. But <laughs> okay, maybe we'll figure out why. All right. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I'm pleased to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I actually think of myself as a science writer, too. I don't know if you would count me among your, uh, your group. Uh, my PhD is in English language and literature. I happen to write for other scientists for the most part. Indeed, I have a commentary that just went unembargoed at 1, 1 p.m. Central Time in JAMA today. Uh, I frequently write about drug safety issues at, at JAMA in the New England Journal. Uh, also, uh, it's a little hard to follow uh, all these talks about sex and then female mice. Uh, so this is going to be a different perspective altogether. I'm an epidemiologist and public health scientist. So by, uh, I, by way of introduction, uh, I have a few disclosures. I don't have support from industry, uh, pharmaceutical or device manufacturers. I did serve as an expert witness uh, uh, legal cases for Baycall, and in fact wrote about that experience, and that's one of the things that I'm going to talk to you about today, is using novel data sources to write about public health issues. Uh, the other thing that I'm going to talk about is creating a consortium to conduct genome-wide association studies. These are really, uh, it, 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 Paul Rayburn is to blame for this uh, combination. I, he invited me to speak here today. I gave him three topics and he selected two. These are the two he selected. <laughs> they are not necessarily related except that I do both. One is actually what I do for a living. Um, I, I'm paid by the NIH to do the genetics research. The other is kind of a recreational activity. But first I'd like to s start with a survey. Uh, I'm just curious to know among science writers which is thought to be a more serious breach concealing the mortality risk of a drug or serving as a, uh, as a guest author on a paper? Who would vote for concealing a mortality risk? Who would uh, vote for serving as a guest author? I, no, you only get one choice. It could be both. No, 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 you can't be both. Okay, I, you only get one vote, <laughs> you know. <laughs> You, are you from Chicago or what? You know, you only get one vote. Okay, you only get one vote. Uh, who thinks that uh, concealing the mortality risk uh, is more newsworthy? Okay, and how about the guest author? I mean, this is kind of corporate malfeasance versus individual malfeasance. You know, in a sense, that's the kind of question I'm posing. All right, let me talk about Baycall. Uh, Baycol is a statin drug. It was the sixth statin drug. It was first marketed in February 1998. I, I will finish by 2 o'clock and then have a few minutes for uh, questions. So I'm a compulsive internist and I, I'm on time. Uh, there was a class label for rhabdomyolysis. By that, the FDA noted an initial label for Baycol that other statins had caused rhabdomyolysis. Uh, rhabdomyolysis is a condition where the muscle cells in the body break down. They spill enzymes into the blood. That frequently causes renal failure and death in about 10%. So this is a major serious adverse event. After the first case, the FDA did not do any monitoring. Baycol was eventually withdrawn in August 2001 because of rhabdomyolysis and the increased risk. Our statins had been extensively evaluated and were well known to prevent heart attacks and strokes. And this was a period of time when the sales of statins were skyrocketing. I checked recently, Lipitor sells more than $5 billion a year now. That's just Lipitor alone in the United States alone. So sales were increasing, and Cerevastatin went along with that sales increase. 
What's the background in terms of drug safety? Um, well, the Kefauer Harris amendments were uh, implemented in 1962. They started for the first time pre market evaluations of efficacy and safety. They improved the evaluation, but they slowed the approval times. And there was no provision actually in those amendments for post market surveillance at all. What happened is with the slowed approval in the late 1980s and the 1990s, patients with cancer and AIDS were un satisfied with the rate at which drugs were being approved in the U.S. So the FDA, uh, the FDA, the Congress passed the Prescription Drug Fee Users Act, increases resources for approvals. Oddly, in this bill, for 1992 to 2002, no money for drug safety, none, none. Now, uh, why did that happen? Well, that, that's, a, that's a reflection of congressional the congressional effects of lobbying, because it made no public health sense. Basically, Congress went ahead and said, we will trust industry to monitor themselves. We will let industry self-regulate. We've seen this in the economy, and we've seen it in the drug industry, and it was equally disastrous in both areas. I, I don't want to sound political here. But what happened is America became the drug safety testing ground in the old days, Practolol came out in Europe. The, uh, the European agencies identified the adverse effects. It came off the market, never showed up in the US market. Once we went with rapid approvals, America became the drug safety testing ground of the world. 68% of drugs were first approved in the US, but we did nothing to augment the drug safety. What system did we have? We had the adverse event reporting system. This is a a voluntary system where physicians call in adverse events to the FDA. It's an incomplete case series. It has uncertain validity. It is the weakest form of scientific evidence, the very weakest form. In fact, it probably provided false reassurance. We would have been better with no system because then we would have known we had nothing. Here we thought we might have had something. Now, it turns out that this system is useful for things like rhabdomyolysis. Rhabdomyolysis is a rare event unrelated to the indication for the drug, and so you can actually figure things out. But not for common side effects like heart attacks with Vioxx, and I'll talk about Vioxx in a bit. The FDA focus at this time, and this is clear in its guidance, was on new unlabeled adverse events that were serious. So once rhabdomyolysis appeared on the Baycall label, they didn't bother to look. They didn't have the staff to look. And this was the main source of our safety information. So we are relying on the companies now to do our work. What was the outcome? Well, this is um, a um, company document. This is a, a bare document that summarizes three months after the drug is on the market, Seven cases of rhabdomyolysis. Seven cases. Um, they are all look like rhabdomyolysis. The CK levels, uh, the CPK levels are all consistent with it. And the strange thing is this column right here. This different column. Local, which is just typical. Can you take the microphone? Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll try to stay here. Is the gemfibrozole uh, column. Six of the seven patients are on gemfibrozole. Now, is this odd? Is this a, a fluke? Well, it turns out that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a pharmacoepidemiologist in part, and so I could, I could look up in data we had, what's the prevalence of LOPID use, gemfibrozole use among statin users? It's about 1%. What's the probability that in the U.S., five of six uh, uh, users would show up randomly using LOPID. It's about one and a quarter billion. So I, when I was working on the, the Bay Call uh, with the Blake Call plaintiff's attorneys, I saw this and I was, mo I was concerned. How would you know if this were actually a drug-drug interaction? Is it a complicated matter? No. This is a matter of a three-day study in 10 patients. 
So if the company were seriously concerned about this signal, and I think it's a signal, they could have conducted a three-day co crossover study in 10 patients. Might have taken them a whole week to complete it, because you have to do three days and then wash out in another three days. Uh, this study was eventually done uh, by, actually by another university, by Backman, and published in 2002. The gemfibrozole contraindication letter, the CBE, the changes being affected letter, did not go to the FDA from Bayer until December 1999. It was more than 18 months after that May 1988 look where they said, hmm, maybe we better do something about this. Uh, this uh, characterized my experience working with the, the, the plaintiff's attorneys. There was this leisurely approach to revealing safety issues that struck me as a huge public health hazard. So uh, as a compulsive internist, what I did is I actually read the protect order. I had to sign a confidentiality order saying I would not reveal any of these documents. But I read it, and I, at the same time, I saw a piece in the New York Times about a trial in Texas uh, using Baycall. And it turned out if I got the information from other sources, I was no longer bound by the confidentiality agreement. So I had an idea about a paper. And so I, I called the Nuensis, I don't know how to say it actually, county clerk, and I asked them to get trial exhibits from the trial. And it cost me a dollar a page. So I just said, ah, Xerox them all, I'll pay for it. I wrote her a check. Actually, she sent me the stuff and she trusted me. I sent her the check later. Uh, so it was terrific. And, but, you know, I realized I was walking on thin ice here. I'm using novel data. I'm at risk because I've worked with plaintiff's attorneys. I've been deposed by Bayer. Bayer is not happy with me. I wasn't happy with Bayer. And so I, I tried to be well defended here. I sought co-authors who were also plaintiff's attorney, working with plaintiff's attorneys. I let my plaintiff's attorneys know that I was going to do this. They were nervous. They did not like this. I, uh, I worked with the deans and the chairs at the University of Washington to let them know what I was doing. Every draft was reviewed by deans and chairs. Um, I also worked with the University of Washington attorneys general, and they reviewed all the drafts. Uh, I don't normally, I don't, you know, in NIH grants, I don't have a line for uh, legal fees for attorneys. So I had to work with the state. And I'm really quite grateful to the university for um, providing me with the protection to be able to do this work. There were multiple reviews from four scientists, at least one from, uh, from the FDA. Bear got a copy of my article and sent me a 30-page review of it. And I had to respond to that. JAMA editors and JAMA attorneys were involved. And uh, so we reported these data. And these are the data that, that, that we saw. I'm just going to show a couple of slides of this. Basically, this is a comparison between atorvastatin and uh, Baycol, Lipitor and Baycol. Overall, the relative reporting rate is 68 high, times higher for, Lipitor, for uh, Baycol than for Lipitor. And for those who are on uh, LOPID, the gemfibrozole as well, it, the relative reporting rate is 855. I've never seen a relative reporting rate that high. Maybe it's my ignorance, but you know this is almost a thousand-fold increase in the risk. David Graham has since published a, uh, a study looking at the risk, and you know how many people, what percent of people do you think we're taking Baycol and cerevastatin wind up with rhabdomyolysis? I want you to come up with a number. 10%. 10%. It's an astonishingly high adverse effect rate. That, I mean, and 10% of those people died. So what did Bayer do with this? Well, here's the memo from the two epidemiologists. And I think they summarized the data well. These are not quite the sex quotations you heard last time, okay? Uh, this is kind of corporate malfeasance. Uh, the findings indicate that in patients receiving monotherapy, cerevastatin substantially elevates the risk for rhabdomyolysis compared with other statins. I think they got it. 
This is in March of 2000. In combination with gemfibrozole, cerevastatin patients were also to be found at, I rather like the turn of phrase, remarkable disadvantage compared with patients receiving gemfibrozole with another statin. The bear epidemiologists knew what was going on. They got it. They absolutely understood. This drug was not withdrawn for yet another August 2001. In August of 2000, a high dose, 0.8 milligrams, was uh, uh, approved, and many people went on to have rhabdomyolysis. Now, there were at least around 3,000 to 4,000 cases that have been settled by Bayer. That's only the settled cases who were known to have rhabdomyolysis. After we published our work on this, and so I was using novel data sources, you guys do this, using publicly available documents from, uh, from a trial here in Texas. Uh, the, one of the UW attorneys general sent me this, and it's Judge Pauly's statement of the um, New York Retirement Association's uh, litigation. See, I, I saw Elliot Spitzer, and I thought of the SSRIs, and, and uh, the way he, he forced uh, uh, the, the, uh, the trial reports, but I won't go there. Uh, you know, this is a, a marketing view of what I regard as a pet public health problem. And it helped explain exactly what I was seeing. A consensus emerged that the data concerning Baycall's dangers was, quote, putting the brand at risk. When that conclusion was communicated to Ebsworth, who headed the pharmaceuticals division, he dismissed the reservations of the safety experts and instructed his marketing team to promote the hell out of the product. So we left regulation to industry, and this is how industry treated the regulatory issues and the safety issues. They proved to be constitutionally incapable of identifying, recognizing, and responding to safety problems. They identified, didn't they? Not publicly. Not publicly. And, and I think that's what matters. So, um, yeah, no, no, the scientists did fine. But the people running the institution, it was like brain death occurred, you know, uh, above a level. So, and it, it reminds me of, you know, Alan Greenspan's comment on he's found a flaw. They, they can't, they can't self-regulate. Well, I, I think that we found this flaw in, in, in drug safety as well. The difficulty with drug safety issues are that when, when, when adverse effects occur, they occur at various hospitals across the country. And these are become totally invisible unless you actually conduct the study and look for it. When the economy crashes, that is the more public crash, more like a plane crash than what we see with the, uh, uh, the drug safety problems. Uh, yeah, I, I, they, she wondered what happened with the, the I don't know. You know, I read depositions by many of these people. I know that Ebsworth was, that Judge Pauly decided that Ebsworth needed to stand trial, okay? Uh, I don't know the results of that trial. I didn't follow it forward. So I'm gonna talk a bit about Vioxx. Uh, uh, it's a non-steroidal for the treatment of arthritis and pain. It is no more effective than naproxen and uh, ibuprofen and other drugs. It is supposed to have fewer GI side effects. Approved in 1999, advertised heavily. Three billion per, per year in sales before long. Eventually withdrawn for heart attack risk. Well, how did they get caught on this one? Well, they did, they were trying to extend the indications and they were doing placebo controlled trials to try to get other indications. So the, the study that actually identified the heart, heart attack risk most convincingly was um, the polyp prevention study. And that's the study, the approved study, which led to the withdrawal in September 2004. But there were also studies for other indications. And what they tried to do is, is see if this drug would prevent decline in cognitive function or progression of Alzheimer's among those who have Alzheimer's. 
and in the published reports about these uh, things, so this is yet another of my science writing activities. Um, and what I did is I worked with one of my colleagues. I did not work on Vioxx as a plaintiff's attorney. I testified at the Senate hearings on Vioxx back in 2004 with David Graham. Um, and because of that activity, I decided it would not be appropriate to turn my own public service into private gain. So I refused all consulting for the company and for any plaintiff's attorneys on Vioxx. Didn't talk to a one. Uh, and so, but Dick Cronwall did, and what he did is he provided me with public documents so I could write about this. Again, we worked with the deans and the chairs. I'd done this before and the attorneys general. So I'm a frequent offender on these matters at the University of Washington. And uh, what struck us is that internal analyses that showed the risks of Vioxx were known by the company and not not were submitted to the FDA in a timely fashion or uh, to the public, made public. So this seemed to be another opportunity, another science writer's opportunity. And this is a, an effort to summarize the trials here. There were actually three. These are the results of two. Now, this comes out of a, um, a work report that's about 150 pages. I have to go to about eight different pages scattered throughout the document to pick out these numbers and then calculate these relative risks. These were not sitting in the, in the, um, in the reports. Uh, they actually did, well, uh, these numbers actually are, are in direct reports. The, uh, the other ones I'll mention are not. The company did intention to treat analyses. Intention to treat analyses are the preferred method in randomized trials, you analyze all the events that occurred in all the patients. Conducted by the sponsor in April 2001, what did they find? A fourfold risk of total mortality in one study and a two and a half fold, almost threefold risk in another study. They say, well, is this chance? You know, what do we use as our standard in science? We use replication. If you think one of the trials had a chance of finding, it actually happens to be replicated in the other study. The likelihood that this is a chance finding is extremely small. This is, to put it politely, a safety signal. This is a safety signal. Known by the company in April of uh, 2001. They submit a report to the FDA, and, and it's this report that's got the numbers all over the place. But actually, the FDA, they have good people there. They are terrific. And I was actually not critical of the FDA so much as industry during the Bush administration and some of the administrative heads of the FDA who sometimes didn't seem to be paying attention. The FDA medical officers look at this and they say, please clarify whether the safety monitoring board and the IRBs overseeing these studies are aware of the excess total cause mortality? Have they commented on the ethics of continuing 078 in light of the mortality data? I mean, here's your FDA doing what it's supposed to do. Here's the sponsor's reply. Mortality findings are, quote, small numeric differences most consistent with chance fluctuations. Well, they're not. There is no safety data and monitoring data. No DSA. MRL Merck Research Labs has not provided these data to the individual IRBs because MRL does not believe that a safety issue has been identified. They're not seeing a safety signal here. In the absence of clear and compelling safety issue, MRL has not broken the study blind. You know, I do think these companies have a kind of parent-like relationship with their product. You know, these are billion dollar babies. Uh, and and I, I imagine it must be very hard for um, epidemiologists within the companies to raise questions about the safety of a drug. You know, you've just got to be enthusiastic. Lots of sales, lots of promotion. Not much in the way of public health. So we, what we had is we had intention to treat analyses of two trials that showed an increase in mortality a finding and a replication, no DSMB, 
the intention to treat data, which are actually more extreme than, than the, uh, the data they submitted to the FDA, were not submitted to the FDA until 2003, about two years after that other report that I showed you. And, uh, you know, these data were just not made public or submitted to the FDA in a timely fashion. If people had known that there was a mortality risk, even in older adults with dementia, uh, do you think they would have been purchasing Vioxx at a huge clip between April of 2001 and uh, 2004? I, I just don't think they would have. You know, what we had was this image of Dorothy Hamill skating painlessly, you know. Uh, uh, now, you know, I could take all the Vioxx in the world, I can't skate like Dorothy Hamill. You know, it just, it's just not going to work. So, you know, this looked to me like a public health hazard. Uh, and, you know, I don't mean to pick on Merck. I'm an equal opportunity uh, uh, person when it comes to safety issues. Pfizer did the same thing. So, we had a, an approved drug with a cardiovascular mortality risk that was identified or made public late. Some of the safety issues were concealed, in my view. The magnitude of the harm was related to the uh, rapid early expansion by direct-to-consumer advertising, the late identification or publication of the risks, and the willingness of physicians to use a new drug. Places like Group Health, actually, we, you know, there, I'm a patient there, I'm also an investigator, uh, they are not quick to put these brand new drugs on formulary. Baycol wasn't on formulary. Fenfen wasn't on formulary, uh, troglitazone wasn't on formulary, and so by uh, uh, it wasn't they they did not approve it for inexpensive use at the HMO. So there was a second order of review. So they helped protect us from um, from those drugs. Um, now what happened is Merck was also using guest authors, and it turned out. Three of the authors on this 078 trial were guest authors. They just put their names onto a paper. I don't believe they ever saw the mortality data. So there, there was some irresponsible authorship there. Say again? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, my own, uns these, two pub these two articles were published together as a pair in April 2008. And what astonished me a bit was actually the fact that um, that the um, the authorship problem got most of the media attention and most of the public interest. I I've been quoted in the media many times. It's not a big deal to me. I'm almost indifferent to it. Uh, but I was struck that the guest authorship seemed to gather more attention than the corporate malfeasance, um, and and I I don't know why. Hence my, uh, my question, my survey at the beginning. So uh, what do I think? Well, industry simply has an asymmetric interest in efficacy and safety. And they have a fiduciary duty to shareholders for return, and they have this parent-like uh, relationship with new products that makes them constitutionally incapable of self-regulating when it comes to drug safety issues. And it's really this failed assumption of national drug makers. That was the congressional assumption in Padufa in 1992. Uh, safety problems are an impediment to marketing su success. And as John Sr., uh, an FDA official, pointed out, it's almost a conflict of interest to expect marketing teams to address safety issues in the post-marketing setting. You know, I, I, I have never gone to business school. I was a student for many years. I cannot imagine a marketing class that says, you should show the risks and benefits of your product comparably. That's a public health message. That's not a marketing message. I think public health becomes a competing interest for them. And so I've actually advocated for a strong, independent FDA and am hopeful that with uh, Peggy Hamburg and Josh Sharfstein that we will see some changes there. So I indicated the source of uh, my initial question, and I'm happy at the point of uh, uh, questions at the end to talk more about that if you'd like to. So let me tell you what I do for a living. Okay, those are my recreational activities. This is actually what you pay me to do uh, 
through your, through your taxes uh, and the NIH grants that I get. So I'm going to talk about a consortium uh, that we put together to conduct genome-wide studies. I'm going to talk about the design a little bit, a few of the selected findings, and then some epidemiologic and public health observations. Now, genome-wide association studies are really unbi unbiased mapping efforts to look across the entire genome to identify genetic variants that might be associated with and potentially be causes of disease. It takes advantage of the HapMap data, and the technology is now relatively low cost. When I started doing genetic studies, I worked on Factor V Leiden and the prothrombin variant in relationship to uh, venous thromboembolism. It cost me $15 per person per SNP. Uh, I can do 300,000 SNPs for about $300 now. So the costs have gone down tremendously. Now, for somebody who, uh, whose ignorance is broad and deep, these agnostic approaches are actually quite attractive. You don't have to know anything about biology. We are simply searching across the genome, and you know, it, it's okay. There's almost a biblical uh, sense to this activity. By not knowing and not bringing our preconceived notions, we might actually be able to learn things. So I, I, kind, of, I kind of like that uh, flavor. Now, I'm the principal investigator of the genome-wide study and the cardiovascular health study. This is like the Framingham study. It's a cohort study of 5,888 older adults recruited at four sites. Uh, we have multiple measures over time, uh, all kinds of measures related to, blood, uh, to aging and cardiovascular blood pressure, lipids, uh, coronary artery. Uh, I mean, uh, carotid artery wall thickness, echocardiograms, all kinds of things. We did the GWAS in participants free of clinical cardiovascular disease, and our primary aim was MI and stroke. And when we wrote the grant three or four years ago, we thought the effect sizes would all be greater than 1.5. Well, we were wrong. Uh, there's a nice summary by Lucia Hindorf of the published genome-wide association studies, and there's now, what, 439. And it turns out the median relative risk that they're detecting for these genetic loci is about 1.25. So these relative risks are very, very small. What that mean, what does that mean? Well, my study was completely underpowered. There's not a chance in the world I will find anything. And if I find anything, it's probably just due to chance. So here I've spent all this money of yours, so, you know, what am I to do? Well, uh, I'll skip this, which is a technical look at the power. We had no power. That, that's the point that I made. Well, what this meant is we needed to look for collaborations and set up collaborations. And this is really a side effect of this GWAS technology and of the fact that there are small relative risks. We need large samples, and we need to be able to replicate these findings to identify reliable and valid genetic associations. So we formed this voluntary federation of five large complex cohort studies. Each had its own organizational structure. We set up a simple organizational structure, and, and the goal was to conduct prospective meta-analyses across multiple common phenotypes that we all shared in common. So all you had to do to get into the charge consortium was to be a cohort study, identify people at baseline, have measures, and have multiple measures at follow-up. That's a cohort study. And you had to have GWAS data. We included cardiovascular health study, Framingham, the atherosclerosis risk and community study, the AGES study from Iceland, and the Rotterdam study. And the novel thing about this consortium, there, you know, there are lots of consortia out there. There's lung cancer, breast cancer, diabetes, but these are single phenotype consortia. So they have, there's limited things that they can do because they all have basically one phenotype. What was novel here is that we used the cohort design as the organizing principle, knowing that we could set up mechanisms that would make this collaboration work across multiple phenotypes. 
And so you just had to be a population-based cohort study. They had to, we, we all actually have similar data collection methods. There's a genealogy to these data collection methods. Eric's, the Eric study started before CHS. We looked at their events protocol when we developed CHS. And so we adapted it. So there are inherent similarities in these studies by virtue of the, the cardiovascular disease community. We had long-term follow-up. The total sample size was more than 40,000. We set up a relatively simple analytic plan. The, the analyses are done within study. We use an additive genetic model. So we say, is there one, zero, one, or, or two genetic variants associated with a trait? It's a simple analysis. We repeat it 2.5 million times across the genome. Uh, and the local, the analysis is done by the local experts who know the study. Then what we do is we do a meta-analysis, and these are planned prospectively, so we try to harmonize the data going in. And the nice thing is that we share results, not data. Individual level data sharing is complicated. It requires permissions but with IRBs. And especially working in Iceland, Europe, and the U.S., it would become very complicated to try to create one single data set. So we chose this method. And it turns out the meta-analysis, I, I know you're all dying to hear this, the meta-analysis approach is more powerful than a two-stage uh, design. We could have said, okay, let's do a meta-analysis in one group and replicate it in another. The, the single discovery approach is much more powerful for finding genuine uh, effects. And it was also culturally powerful, uh, and this I attribute to our friendly biostatisticians. Uh, you know, I, I, I've been in er, uh, phone calls twice a week with Framingham since June of 2007 to do this. And uh, they would call me up and they'd say, well, we, would you be the replication site for my study? You know, well, maybe I wanted them to be the replication site for my study. When, when you divide it up and you have a discovery and a replication, there's a kind of class status that inheres in, in that approach. It just, it is. It turns out that when you do a meta-analysis, you all join the same analysis together, and it has helped create cohesion among the various groups. So our biostatistical colleagues have contributed more than just the analytic, but also to the kind of cultural shaping of this consortium. Well, how do we do this? Well, we've got working groups. Uh, the working group idea started, I think, in, in CHS. David Siskovic originated it. It's actually a, a, a set of investigators. It was set up to, they were interested in a phenotype like diabetes. It had senior, I, it was the renal group, actually, that started this senior investigators, and then they had uh, junior investigators. And it was a way to, to conduct mentoring. And that's how it started. Uh, and we used the working group model, and we basically turn each phenotype over to the working group. They make all the decisions. This is a steering committee across these five cohorts whose most important vote ever has been whether to approve the minutes from their last conversation. We have no power. All right, all the power resides in the working groups. They make decisions. We, we do have an analysis committee that recommends a central analysis. This becomes very easy because then each group can adopt or adapt that analysis and they don't have to rediscover the wheel every time on how to do the analysis. And the working groups agree on timing, establish responsibilities, authorships, and other collaborators. Here's one result, a junior investigator, the lead author, author in Nature Genetic. This is what we call a Manhattan plot. And what it does is it plots, yeah, probably go better. yes, here's the, uh, the negative log of the p-value. So these are very small p-values, highly significant finding. And this is the genome. These are the chromosome numbers. And you can see there are, set, there are actually 14 peaks here, all right? We have some that look like Indiana plots. Uh, they're just completely flat, meaning that there's no genome-wide associations. I trained in Indiana, and 
Indiana's completely flat until you get to the southern half when you get to some hills. But uh, so this is uh, typically what we look for. And you know, there were uh, uh, nine of the 14 loci here. were in, in known genes. There were five new loci that we identified. One is near uh, phospholambam, and it suggests the importance of calcium signaling in myocardial repolarization. The QT is a, is a measurement on the electrocardiogram. Long QTs are associated with sudden death. So that's the reason for our interest in long QT. The blood pressure findings were published in Nature Genetics a few months ago. 29,000 in the meta-analysis. We found a common variant that was in a gene, uh, one of the cytochrome P450 genes, uh, that is actually associated with a rare Mendelian form of um, high blood pressure. Another variant, the SH2B3, is associated, with, it's an it's a inflammation gene associated with type 1 diabetes, celiac disease, and other conditions. And uh, this slide summarizes the effects on blood pressure. Here's the number of abnormal uh, genetic variants. The effect on blood pressure as we have higher numbers. And here's the representation of how many people have these uh, variants. So these are the kinds of results that we have. What's happened here? Well, it's become even more complicated than when we started. Uh, what we did with the blood pressure paper is we became aware of a European consortium, the the global BP Gen, they're the blood pressure consortium. And uh, we exchanged top hits with them uh, and published back-to-back -back papers in Nature Genetics. And uh, as a result of working with them, we now work with them. So I have conference calls twice a month with what is now the ICBP, the International Collaboration on Blood Pressure Genetics. We're doing a full meta-analysis across both groups, 64,000. 733. We're doing some additional replication genotyping in an experiment involving another 50,000 Europeans. And then we have plans for future genotyping in, in, uh, in additional non-Europeans. So the, this is the track that some of these working groups are taking. There are multiple examples of this. The QT is now a global, global or larger consortium, pulmonary functions, erythrocyte traits, the red cell traits. This is a list of our selected publications. We have about 14 papers now. They're in major journals, Nature Genetics, Lancet, New England Journal, JAMA. Uh, I think we're doing key work in identifying new genetic variants associated with a variety of important phenotypes. Well. There have been challenges along the way, um, and that includes maintaining communications, trust, and transparency across the cohorts. CHS probably has about 100, 150 investigators. Across all of the charged cohorts, there are easily 500 investigators. So the communications has been difficult. I have to manage the workflow across the 30 working groups because we do the analysis in my, in my lab, as it were. We have to coordinate and identify genotyping efforts, and it's been a vast and complicated effort. I think we've got some interesting achievements. It's, it's been a novel research structure and framework. The GWAS data has transformed the way we work in cardiovascular epidemiology. We used to write our own papers coming out of each of the, the various cohorts. Occasionally, we collaborate with Eric or Framingham. There are some examples of that. But now there are huge collaborations here that we've established. Um, we have probably 10 or 15 papers under review, another 20 or 30 that are in progress. Uh, there are opportunities for junior investigators here, so it's an outstanding place for training as well. Uh, settings for new studies, ancillary studies, and it's a catalyst for new studies because the identification of a genetic locus is simply the beginning of another major research effort. And, you know, I find myself being an international mem mentor uh, for people in Rotterdam as well as people in Framingham or uh, the Eric people. Uh, 
uh, across many studies. Now, I, I only have about two more slides and then I will entertain questions. The genetics is usually represented as important for clinical translation, and they talk about prediction, personal medicine, and novel biologic insights as the main areas uh, for progress. Uh, prediction, the hope here is that there will be diagnostic or prognostic tests. I, I am not sure that that's going to happen, at least not immediately. This slide represents the uh, number of genes genetic variant that you'd need uh, to discriminate those with and without for the various relative risks. And you can see that you would need about uh, 150, 200 genes uh, if you have relative risks of 1.25. So the prediction I, I am not confident about. Personalized medicine is another area I'm very interested in, drug gene interactions and cardiovascular disease. We're not far along there. We hope to be and we work on advancing it. I think actually the people in cancer are much further along than we are. And I use the EGFR mutations uh, in non-small cell lung cancer as one potential example. I think mostly what we're doing is contributing novel, novel biologic insights that may lead to future targets either for prevention efforts or for drug treatments. So that's, that's how I would rank these. Uh, in epidemiology, we have two goals. I think one is to identify the causes of disease, and I, I think we're doing that here. I think, I think we're doing good work with your, your taxpayers' money. The other is improvements in the health of the public. I think they're further along. I actually think my recreational activities are more directly aimed at trying to improve the health of the public than these genetic studies. And uh, I will insist as we move forward that, uh, you know, the translational standards for moving these tests into practice are actually observed. So in summary, um, I think the immediate benefit here is the novel loci and the potential biologic insights. We're hoping to identify new mechanisms and pathways. And I haven't talked a lot about specific genes. I'm, I'm actually, I've talked about the construction of a framework that can help uh, facilitate that. I think there'll be little immediate translational benefit. I think the population scientists like myself are actually contributing ideas to our basic science colleagues, uh, such as the, the Clegg, Professor Clegg this morning, who might be able to take some of those studies f further. And it's been a, a fine experiment and collaboration. So I would just like to acknowledge a not, some of my collaborators. This is a limited list, both in the drug safety work, and I've identified one person from each of the cohorts, but there are literally hundreds who are working in the CHARGE consortium. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, any questions? Yeah, as one who's uh, covered the evil doings of the drug industry for probably longer than you've been in practice, I kind of... <laughs> we can swap lies here. <laughs> right. But anyway, I've come to think that almost a better idea would be to try to get over to the public some basic precepts, such as just because it's new doesn't mean it's better. And uh, that needs to go to physicians too. And I wonder if you think there's any possibility of revoking the legislation that provided direct drug advertising on television. All right. To the uh, public. Yeah. Uh, you know, let me just start with the first point. I agree with you. In, in, in America is pathologic in a way that Europe is not. We assume that what, it, what is new is best. We assume that if the price is higher, it's better. And, you know, in many cases, that's just not so. Um, we seem constitutionally incapable of assessing, the taking into account information about the risks. And if we did that, we might not be so enthusiastic about using all these new things. I, so I, I'm going to leave it up to you folks to persuade um, the public. I mean, I do my best. I write about, I write about drug safety all the time. Uh, and then just to comment on your second uh, point, I don't think in America it's going to be possible with the First Amendment to, uh, and the court structure we have right now, uh, to 
suppress uh, direct-to-consumer advertising, it would probably need to be a voluntary effort between the FDA and industry. I, I, I don't think, I don't think a, a, a law by Congress would stand uh, the Roberts Court. You know, that's my audience. I write for doctors, I, you know, and, uh, but they're Americans too, and I think they have this, I think they suffer the same, same disabilities that the, the, the public does. I don't think, I agree with you, I do not think that uh, direct-to-consumer advertising contributes to the public health a bit. Just a uh, follow-up to that. Um, I mean, that's one of the things that people are looking to comparative effectiveness research perhaps to help answer. And I'm wondering if, if the 1.1 billion pie, I mean, some of that's going to the uh, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. And, and I'm just wondering about your thoughts as to how effective, you know, if, wh whether that would, could help foster more crosstalk between that agency and the FDA, for example, or getting more of the studies out, you know, that, that you've done and other people have done, because there have been some studies like this. And so I'm just wondering what your thoughts are as to you know, are you optimistic that this money will actually help in that regard? Um, I'm an epidemiologist, so optimism is not a dimension that I experience. Uh, I have to say, let me just make several unrelated comments, and if I contradict myself very well, I contradict myself. After all, I am American, that's a quotation from Walt Whitman for those who don't recognize it. Uh, uh, you know, it's, I, I've done comparative effectiveness studies since I was knee-high to a grasshopper uh, for drugs. They are exceedingly difficult to do well. Uh, as a reviewer, as electronic medical records have come forward, I've been a reviewer on multiple papers that are junk. Uh, and I, I have concerns that what we'll have with these administrative level data are precise estimates that are biased. Uh, it's hard to do these studies well, and it's often expensive. So I, and you know, for instance, I've never done a study looking at diabetes drugs because of one of the problems of confounding by time. People who have diabetes at one time will start on a family of drugs, and if they have it at a later time, they start on often another family. If you try to compare those two, the populations tend to be fundamentally different in their duration of diabetes. There are some that are actually good studies. For instance, pioglitazone and rosaglitazone came on the market at the same time and had basically the same indications. Uh, and so actually drug studies that compare them can often be done well. So these studies need to be done well. They cannot simply be turned out. You know, I do work at Group Health and in the setting there in the HMO Research Network. I think they've worked hard to try to set up high quality studies, but it's very expensive, it's very difficult. These will not be substitutes for trials. We cannot, we, we still need tr trials, and I'm not sure the companies are capable of doing them well. In fact, my comment in JAMA, my comment in JAMA, JAMA today raises questions about a European clinical trial that I think was not done well, and I think the results cannot be taken seriously in the face of a, a poorly conducted trial. So we will continue to need trials. I'm hoping that some of that money will go to trials. One of the assumptions that the IOM made in their uh, reports, uh, their, their top 100, is basically the, the evidence we have from the drug companies is, is valid and reliable. I'm not sure that's true. So I think we need lots of comparative effectiveness. And, you know, as a chronic worrier, I must have anxiety disorder or something, maybe there's a drug for me. Uh, you know, I worry about the quality of these studies and, and the conclusions. And so I, I'm hopeful that we'll get some good information from comparative effectiveness. And, you know, I hope to have a role along the way, either as a commentator, uh, investigator, Complainer, who knows? I have a question related to, I thought you did a, actually a wonderful job of describing the way that the predictive power of the phenotypes is not, is not there yet. But I see a parallel between the way the newest drug catches on in the American imagination 
and the way the predictive power that may not really be there likewise catches fire. And I think the um, personalized genomic um, direct-to-consumer sales are, are again parallel to direct-to-consumer. So I wondered if you could just talk about the playing with fire aspect <laughs> of, of <coughs> your discoveries through that, you know, careful research, but how the public receives yeah. it. Well, you know, there's biotech, there's biotech hype around, you know, these tests. Uh, you know, I was actually on a group health panel that thought about the human subjects issues in relationship to uh, revealing risks. And, you know, there's nothing here that in any of the studies that we found that I, f I feel that I would need to inform a patient about. We've informed patients about risks all along. We take them in, we measure their blood pressure. If it's high, that's a clinically important finding. We, we actually, it's not me, somebody else's T-Mobile is going off. Uh, I, I don't hear well, so I can't always localize. Um, uh, I lost where I was. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so, so we, we, we uh, identify those risks for people. I personally am totally, I lack all curiosity about my genome. You know, <laughs> I really do. Um, there's some terrific work going on out there, though. Uh, I'm thinking of Eric Schott and, you know, his thinking about how these various systems and genes are integrated, and he's calling some of the chronic diseases we have emergent properties of systems that interact in complex ways. It's terrific work. You know, I'm also a student of science. I've been a student for many years now. And I, I think there's some terrific work going on uh, in those areas. Um, but, you know, I, I guess we all need to oversell our stuff a bit. And maybe I've been, uh, I'm sure industry probably thinks I'm, uh, or may think I'm an attention getter or something. I, I'm, I'm happy to, to I know. and. I, I, fi I finished on time. I told you. <laughs> Different kind of question. Uh, if you, if one of these uh, meta-analyses uh, actually needs to have the work of 500 scientists, what are we going to do about uh, about encouraging collaboration and making sure that these young scientists get the recognition they need in order to grow? I, I think we're doing that. Uh, I, you know, my next promotion is emeritus. You know, I've published 400 papers. It, it is. I've published 400 papers. You know, it just doesn't matter to me if I'm a first author or a last author. And actually, at this stage in my career, the creation of this collaboration is very satisfying. And to, so, so to see it as a place where junior investigators can make use of the data I've spent 20 years collecting, I think is a terrific idea. And I think many of us feel that way. Um, and so I, I don't know about all scientific communities. I'm, I'm a public health scientist and an epidemiologist. And that's the approach that we've taken. And it's really worked quite well. If you were going to do an op-ed piece on how to improve the FDA, what would be your top three principles? Leadership, leadership, and leadership. And um, so those would be my top three in that order. And um, uh, I'm hoping that, um, that Peggy uh, Hamburg, I don't know her personally. I've, uh, I've met with Josh Sharfstein on occasion. I, I'm hopeful that um, they will do things. I know that they hired Alta Chero uh, as part of the science group. She's terrific. I was on the IOM Drug Safety Committee with her. I think I read in the New York Times website that, that Peter Lurie has been hired in, too. Is that correct? What a brilliant strategy. I mean, Peter works with, with Sid at Public Citizen. So <sighs> leadership is, is what I think we need there. And then the absence of an administration that uh, has political agendas like Plan B and various other things. So those would be, and I think we need to give them time. Because, you know, I've read a bunch of the FDA medical reviews, 
And those people are terrific. They do good work. I, you know, um, they really do. And they just need the leadership to support their, their concerns. Okay. I think we'll wrap this up. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. So we're